Hello, this is Doug Gerlach from iClub Central. Welcome to our stock, uh, Lunchtime Stock Club webinar. Today is Tuesday, July 11th, 2016. Glad you could join me today. We're going to be taking a look at a stock of interest, talk about the market in general, should give you an update on one of iClub Central's tools, and uh, answer any questions you might have about the market or about all of the iClub Central line of software for individual investors and investment clubs. Uh, if you're having technical problems at any point, I remind you to contact on, go to webinar directly via their toll-free number or on their website. Uh, and as always, if you are having uh, audio difficulties or if the graphics of the video are coming in uh, in a, a distorted manner, we recommend that you turn off programs that are running in on your computer, particularly those that might be running in the background that might be using your computer's processing power. We also recommend not using Wi-Fi uh, to use a wired connection. We'll deliver a faster experience all around, and you can always listen using the telephone if you are having particular problems with the technical or the audio portion of today's webinar. I point to the go to webinar application to the questions box. Please make sure to expand that and type in questions at any point during the webinar or uh, at, during the question and answer session at the end and I'll be monitoring those. Our handout is available in the handout tab, the PDF, so you can grab that now. Print it quickly or save it for future reference. It'll also be available when we archive the video of today's webinar session. So please make sure to grab that if you are interested. Our complete schedule of upcoming webinars is located on iClub.com in the learning tab. We have a webinar section there that's got links to all of our archived webinars as well as our schedule of future webinars. Our next regularly scheduled uh, webinar will be our investment club webinar on July 19th. Uh, we'll also be uh, joining meeting again as our at our lunchtime stock club on August 8th and then our toolkit six user group will be on Tuesday August 16th so the regular schedule for July and August for those three regular uh, regular uh, webinars and we've got some special webinars coming up as well I'll tell you about those at the end of our presentation today uh, as always you can like us on Facebook to get occasional updates and notices when archived webinars are released uh, if you ever miss a webinar uh, and get other updates to the news about uh, all, all of our suite of tools for investors and investment clubs. Just look for iClub Central on Facebook. So here we are in July. The year is now half over. And uh, where do we stand in terms of the market? Well, let's take a look at the three market segments that I like to track. The S&P 500 in blue, the Russell 2000 small cap index in green, and the Morgan Stanley Europe Australasia Far East Index in red, that EFA index tracks the mostly large cap companies in the developed world. Uh, so it is a good proxy for uh, the S&P 500 or a comparison to the S&P 500 uh, for uh, the, the developed markets outside the U.S. Uh, as you can see here, the S&P 500 has actually reached an, uh, a year-to-date high. It's up 4.75%. It's behind the green bar on the right there. Uh, the Russell 2000, which has uh, turned in a pretty phenomenal performance uh, as well, now up 4.65% coming back from that down period uh, in, uh, in, in February when the market really tanked. Uh, the S&P 500, uh, reached an all-time high on June 8th, so uh, we uh, and then uh, promptly uh, took a little bit of a nosedive, and now is back uh, in uh, near record territory. Uh, the Russell 2000 is up 22 percent since February, uh, so that's a phenomenal return from that down market. It still uh, hasn't uh, 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 and reset all-time high in June of 2015. We're still not quite back to that level yet uh, that we were a year ago with the small cap market, uh, but it's been a, a tumultuous year, a lot of turbulence, uh, but performance good. If you were uh, picking stocks during the during February, uh, you'd be sitting on some, some nice gains right now by and large. Of course, the, the EFA index uh, down 4.3% 
uh, year to date. It's up a little bit. Of course, Brexit, the British uh, English uh, election to uh, leave the European Union has been weighing on international and domestic markets, although the US, here in the U.S. the markets have mostly shaken off the, the, uh, the thoughts of uh, a negative, uh, a negative, a long-term negative uh, impact from from Brexit. Uh, it's not quite the same elsewhere around the world. So uh, the EFA has not uh, really recovered much at this point. You can see on the chart, it's up a little bit from where it had been um, down uh, down about five uh, ten percent. Uh, year to date and now down only 4.3 percent so it has recovered a little bit there but there's still a lot of a lot of uh, consternation and worry about the impact of brexit and we'll talk more about that as well uh, the EFA index is still down from its high that was reached two years ago in June 2014 lots of lots of problems with European economies uh, with debt in some of the members of the EU, et cetera. Uh, so it's no surprise that uh, those, Europe, those international markets have uh, not quite uh, recovered. Uh, it's interesting, if you look at this graph, you can see all three of these segments uh, generally kind of tracking together, uh, and that uh, speaks to the increasing uh, uh, globalization of the economy, I think. I mean, you look at this period here uh, from February uh, to uh, May, where we really see the markets all kind of going up uh, in a range here, in a band. Uh, and when they've taken come down, you can see the impact uh, here of the Brexit vote on the U.S. Uh, and the international economies. Uh, so I see that there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of a lot of increasing correlation uh, with all the trade agreements and and uh, the performance uh, that we can we can validate and capture uh, across the US markets for what's going on elsewhere in the world so I'm, I'm very pleased with the uh, the uh, Russell's recovery from that uh, February uh, deep dive that it took uh, and again I, I think was we're looking at the 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 expected performance this year you know we're not we we at the uh, small cap informer and the investor advisory service we're not we don't make market predictions uh, but when we were looking ahead at this year we did note that analysts were still looking at a, uh, a perhaps five percent gain uh, for the s p 500 earnings so large company stocks gaining about five percent uh, for the year in terms of their earnings power, which would translate to a 5 to 7% uh, capital appreciation, the total return uh, for the S&P 500. And uh, you know, so that's more or less where we've been. Uh, and the economy continues to deliver mixed signals where uh, the, uh, there a lot of revisions. Uh, the jobs number came in uh, stronger than was expected. Uh, but of course, this is a pol political year, election year. So the politicians are going to make the most of whichever aspect of changes in the economy that serves them best. So it can be really hard to find uh, unbiased information and interpretation. Uh, but I think the bottom line is the economy uh, is not as bad as it could be. It's not as bad as some people have predicted. Uh, it is not recovering as quickly as some people would like. Uh, but the economy seems to be in fairly strong state uh, here in the U.S. Uh, and that uh, is certainly good. Uh, a large part of the, the market performance, of course, is driven by fundamentals. Uh, as we look at the S&P 500 P.E. ratio, it is up again this month, uh, and it was up uh, last month as well. We're at uh, 2474. Uh, last month, we were at 2422. Uh, in May, we were at 2384. In March, uh, or in April 2263. So the, uh, that, that P.E. ratio has been climbing. Uh, and you can see now that we are at a level uh, that we've only reached once before prior to the 1990s, um, uh, where everything kind of went to hell in a handbasket with the, uh, the dot-com boom of the 90s and then uh, the uh, financial crisis of 2008. Uh, the NASDAQ crash of 2000. So we just see a lot of uh, turbulence in the last 20 years. Uh, but uh, 
prior to that, the S&P 500 would, was rarely above 20. So to get to 24 uh, is pretty, pretty high. Uh, so that uh, I like to look at that and think about that. Of course, the reason for that uh, is that uh, the earnings of the S&P 500 have been going down. So you can see here that the earnings peaked uh, earlier this year. The S&P 500 earnings uh, reached an all-time high here in uh, January, so at that level, and you can see since then those uh, the earnings have been falling down to now 87, 89. Uh, that's uh, uh, actually a little bit higher than last month. The trailing 12-month earnings as of last month were 87.53, so 40 cents higher actually. Uh, but uh, really, the, the trend there is down. Large company stocks uh, are. Uh, uh, the earnings power, again, as expected, looking for 5% growth uh, for the year, uh, according to analyst consensus estimates at the beginning of the year. Uh, so no surprise that we're seeing this decline now. Energy stocks still getting hammered, not delivering results. Uh, we see the same thing from uh, some of the other sectors as well, uh, but surprising strength in the rest of it. Uh, Apple's declining earnings have a big impact on the S&P 500 earnings because of the size of Apple and uh, its weighting in the S&P 500. Uh, so if you take out Apple, you take out the energy stocks, uh, the earnings are, are not quite as bad, and there's certainly pockets of strength in many industries uh, and sectors. But as those earnings go down and the prices go up, that's why we see the P.E. ratio increasing. And that's a sign, I think, of investor confidence in the market. Uh, investors are not looking at earnings, go, the, the decline in earnings, as a long-term trend that must uh, reverse itself, but as a short-term aberration uh, and that we'll see companies uh, hitting back uh, getting back on their stride uh, at the end of this year in the, set, in the third and fourth quarters going into a stronger 2017 once the election is resolved uh, and we take the uncertainty out of the equation, uh, then uh, uh, people are, are more inclined to make decisions based on uh, what they think they know, uh, based on who becomes elect gets elected to the White House. So uh, no surprise here. To, to, to see this, uh, as I said before, I think the third and fourth quarters, we'll see those S&P 500 earnings uh, start to take an uptick again. Uh, that's my expectation, uh, and that would certainly help uh, support not necessarily an increase in the valuation of the market, but the it would justify the validation of the market justify the market's valuation uh, that it's reached right now. Uh, so it got, getting a little ahead of itself, uh, so some positive earning strength, I think, will, will buoy uh, those results. So the market, uh, again, we don't uh, invest on the basis of where we expect the market to go this year or next year or in the short term at all. Uh, and we're always going to be looking at our uh, good companies at good prices. So, uh, I have, uh, oh, let me, let me um, make an adjustment here. I have a, uh, uh, a little product uh, uh, spotlight uh, for our My iClub product. We've been working on this product. Uh, last month I told you, or um, two months ago I told you about our new, uh, the demo of our My Stock Prospector tool that's available uh, now that you can try it for free using uh, dated data, so older data, but you can try building screens, you can try out the criteria, uh, and you can see how it works. Uh, for those of you who are subscribers, we uh, recently released a, uh, a, an update that allows you to email your stock screen uh, to uh, a recipient. So the idea here is that you've created a screen and now you want to share it with a member of your club, uh, with other people in your club. Uh, you want to be able to give, let them see the results. Uh, and so uh, the, the way the function works is uh, you click a link, you enter the email of the people you want to share your screen with. Uh, they get the email, they get a link, they can click on the link and they can then view and sort the results of your stock screen. Obviously, those of you who are in investment clubs, 
this can be a great way to to share the research that you're doing, allowing people to find stocks uh, from this list and, and let them practice their their selection skills from a smaller universe rather than saying pick a stock from the 8,000 North American equities and do a stock study on it. Uh, here is a list of stocks that you've created of a particular growth rate or valuation or profit margin trend uh, and let people take a look at those. So the way that this function works is uh, that uh, when you created your screen at My Stock Prospector, over here on the right in the the, uh, 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 the little toolbar above the screen is an envelope uh, indicate that you can email your results when you move the mouse over. It says email results. Just click on that little envelope and you'll get a, a, a screen here where you can enter the email of the recipient and uh, you can add some custom text to it. Uh, the email will come from iClub.com. It doesn't come from you directly, uh, but your name will be on the, on the, uh, the email that you get. Uh, right now, this email uh, field only goes to one person at a time, uh, but we're working on an update to that, which I expect to roll out uh, quite soon, that will allow you to enter a number of uh, recipients there. Uh, and then after that, if it's something Another idea I have here is to allow you to select one of your investment clubs uh, from my iClub, and then the email would just go to all members of that club, so you wouldn't have to enter the uh, individual addresses. Uh, so that's something that we're working on. If you like that idea, let me know, and we'll bump it up. Uh, so again, the idea here, once you click on the screen, then uh, the recipient gets a, a link, and that link takes them to My Stock Prospector, uh, and from there, uh, they can view the results here of this particular screen. Now, they can sort on columns, they can adjust, uh, they can um, uh, view the little pop-up mini graphs, uh, they can't change the screen in any way. They can't uh, change the growth rate that you've uh, selected or any of the other criteria. Uh, they can export it into Excel if they want. Uh, they cannot um, uh, save, save the screen unless they are a My Stock Prospector uh, subscriber themselves. So this is, uh, again, uh, trying to make tools that clubs can use, knowing that many of your club members are not going to be uh, uh, interested or willing or capable of developing screens in my stock prospector uh, so but uh, I think that every investment club should have at least one member who subscribes to my stock prospector can do the uh, the screening for the club uh, to find competitors in a particular industry to find stocks to study to fill holes in the club portfolio uh, Cher says, if you have SSG Plus, uh, is my stock prospector included? Uh, no, SSG Plus is a better investing product. Uh, there is a light stock screener included there, uh, so it doesn't have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, 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 criteria, just some basic criteria. Uh, so it's a really kind of a beginner, simple screen. Uh, we make other our stock central site has a screener, a simple screener, our equity research service has a slightly more advanced screener, and then My Stock Prospector is the full featured screener. Um, the subs My Stock Prospector is available for $49.99, uh, and we, we periodically uh, have some bundles and some other options uh, that we might uh, uh, that, uh, uh, bring that price down a little bit. Uh, but for 50 bucks a year, uh, something you can use uh, every month to create custom reports and to uh, screen for, for stocks, uh, it seems to be a, it's a pretty good bargain. Uh, and you won't find this level of fun, fundamental stock screening anywhere else on the Internet uh, at any price. We, we allow you to screen on 10-year growth rates. We allow you to screen on the trend of pre-tax profit margins so you can find the strongest companies in a particular industry, et cetera. So uh, really a lot of functionality there. Uh, if you have questions, we can continue to take a look at it. Uh, but we've got, I've got a, webinar, a demo webinar available, uh, and we'll probably do some more in the not-too-distant future. So words of wisdom, I like to read a lot. I like to look and uh, 
think about uh, the market and why we do what we do and always looking for the validation that our approach is one that works. Uh, and so I've, uh, last time I, we, we met, I talked about a book about Charlie Munger. Uh, and so I've had Charlie Munger on my brain and uh, I found this quote from the 2009 from the Wesco Financial Corp uh, annual meeting. Uh, that uh, uh, Munger is the chair of that uh, of that uh, company, which is 80% uh, owned by a division of Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, but uh, so in 2009, so in the depths of the Great Recession, Munger said, "If you wait until the economy is working properly to buy stocks, it's almost certainly too late." I have no feeling that. Just because there's more agony ahead for the economy, you should wait to invest. And I think this speaks to that fear of flight index, that, uh, uh, that fear of flight a tendency, that uh, the instinct that many of many investors have when the market uh, and the economy is not working with them, uh, they get nervous and they get scared and they want to sell out. And Charlie Munger has a long-term approach to the market uh, and here he's, he's telling us that when we're in a recession, when we're in a bear market, uh, when we're in difficult times, there's no reason to wait. Even if you acknowledge that the, the future of the economy or the market is uncertain, even if you acknowledge that more pain is likely to come, that's not a valid reason to avoid investing in the market. Of course, Charlie is a is a, a, a investor in individual companies. He's not an ETF uh, investor or index fund investor. He believes in finding good companies and buying them at the right price. Uh, he and Warren use slightly different methods from the Better Investing iClub toolkit approach, but there's a lot of commonality in our perspectives on how individuals like you and me can invest in the market. So uh, I think that's always, uh, I, I like this quote because of the acknowledgement about the agony ahead. And just so many investors are so afraid of what might happen uh, when times are tough that they, uh, they, they act in ways that are run contrary to the welfare of their own portfolios. So recessions and bear markets always end. We have not yet experienced a bear market or a recession or a depre an economic depression that has gone on eternally. They may feel that way when we're in the midst of them, but they always do come to a close. And those investors who are astute enough to know that during those tough times, during those market dips, if we take advantage of the market, then we will benefit over the long term. So uh, what am I reading uh, last month or the month before we talked about uh, the book, a couple of months ago, I guess, uh, Juggling with Knives, a book about volatility in the markets uh, and in life by Jim Juback, uh, who is a longtime financial editor and, and writer. And he just announced he has a new website called jugglingwithknives.com. It's based on the book. Uh, and uh, on this site, Jim expects to be uh, writing about uh, uh, various topics related to volatility, uh, stocks, bonds, options, ETFs, and in everyday life. Uh, but if you sign up by September 1st uh, on the site, you get free access to the website forever, he says. Uh, if you bought the book, uh, there's a secret code in the book that you can use as well. But he, he's opened it up to uh, to everyone to allow you to sign up. If, over here on the right side, uh, you can see here the newsletter sign up. This is where you can sign up. Just your email address, first name, and last name, uh, and you will get his updates there uh, as he posts them. Uh, I find his uh, his 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 writing style to be very readable and his approach to the market to be very sensible. Uh, so I would definitely recommend uh, adding this uh, to uh, your list of pundits that you might follow uh, to, to give you some some perspective on what's going on in the markets. Uh, Jim covers options uh, and bonds so and ETFs as well as stocks, so he does 
uh, get into some, some more sophisticated investing methodologies and techniques, uh, which can be educational as well. So let's take a look at some of the uh, stocks of interest. Oh, before I do that, I see that uh, Frederick has recommended Flash Boys by Michael Lewis. Uh, about the uh, the uh, Michael Lewis is a terrific writer. He wrote the the Blind Side, uh, which was made into a movie uh, with uh, Sandra Bullock. Uh, again, a terrific book. Uh, he's also written extensively on. The, uh, on the market, uh, wrote a book called Flash Boys about the, uh, uh, the, the uh, traders who caused the flash crash of a couple of years ago. Uh, and again, his books are, are enlightening. He wrote about the, uh, the financial crisis meltdown. Uh, so I would definitely recommend, uh, yeah, Michael Lewis's Flash Boys. It's a great book. It's an easy read. Uh, I think it, it moves very quickly uh, and is uh, just incredibly illuminating in every couple of pages you go. Are you serious? Are you kidding? People actually do this? How can, how can people think that this is right? Uh, and it's just uh, kind of flabbergasting in, in many ways. Uh, but thanks for that recommendation, Frederick. So look for Flash Boys by Michael Lewis for sure. Uh, so we're going to take a look at a stock of interest. Uh, this month's selection comes from our Small Cap Informer website. Uh, we're going to take a look at BJ's Restaurants. The ticker is BJRI. Uh, we recommended it in the uh, June 2016 issue of the Small Cap Informer. Uh, so this is... Uh, uh, this is a, a stock that I cover for the newsletter, uh, and it is an, a restaurant stock. The current price, uh, as of uh, close of last Friday, was about forty-five fifty-five. It's basically the same as uh, when the uh, small cap informer was published. So our stock study, uh, or for, I'm sorry, it's forty-three fifty-four, uh, forty-three fifty-five. Um, so I think that's the current price. Um, uh, you know what? Let me let me look it up and see. We'll, we'll refresh the price right now. It was the price was forty three fifty five. Yeah, so it's about the same price. It's exactly the same price as when the issue was published. Forty three dollars fifty cents. Uh, the current P is twenty three point uh, six. There's no yield. Uh, the fifty two week high is fifty one. Uh, so it's down a little bit off the high. Uh, the buy up to price on my stock study is 49.50. Looking for 15% earnings growth. Uh, and that's going to come from sales expansion uh, and uh, some uh, some margin expansion as well. And the projected total return of about 16%. Here is the uh, SSG graph. Uh, so you can see some fairly consistent sales growth. It's slowing a little bit uh, as they reach that one billion dollars in sales mark. Uh, the uh, margins have been a little erratic, uh, again, but this is a small national, uh, growing national change, mostly regional at this point, uh, but they, they intend to expand um, uh, across into, into more markets, uh, but they're doing it kind of sensibly. Uh, and you can see the earnings, a little bit of a decline in 2013, but they have uh, been uh, ratcheting back up and analysts are looking at about the same 15% uh, results that uh, I've pegged for this particular company here. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, here is uh, uh, the BJ's restaurant. Sorry about I was I had the slides on pause there for a minute. So here's the BJ's, uh, the BJ's restaurant overview for you, BJRI, um, and just to review, the uh, recommended in the June uh, 2016 small cap informer, uh, the in restaurant industry, current price 43.55, the, uh, uh, and I think about a 15, 16% total return that we'll get there. Uh, here is the uh, graph that you can take a look. At the at the results, so very consistent sales growth uh, as they've ramped up from uh, 200 million to almost a billion in the last uh, in the last 10 years, uh, and margins have been growing a little less consistently, uh, but they've uh, been expanding. The margins been expanding in the last couple of months, and you can see the analysts expectations are plotted on the graph as well. I'm, I'm projecting a, about a 10% sales growth over the next five years uh, with 15% earnings growth uh, coming from some of the margin expansion uh, that, uh, that they've got underway. 
So uh, some of the things that I like about the business, uh, this is a very small company. They've got 174, actually 176 restaurants right now in 23 states. Uh, they operate BJ's Restaurant and Brewery, BJ's Restaurant and Brew House, and BJ's Pizza and Grill. The restaurant and brewery, as the name implies, this is a this is a, 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 a micro brewery chain. So they actually are uh, making beer in the restaurants uh, that the, that they're selling it at. The brew house is uh, uh, where they are uh, serving beer that they make, but they don't make it at that particular location. Uh, they've got uh, a handful of uh, standalone breweries that make the beer uh, that is sold only in their uh, in their uh, their their restaurant, so they're not selling it commercially uh, elsewhere. You can uh, get bottles to go uh, and growlers uh, filled in the restaurants, uh, but uh, you uh, uh, won't find their their beer in stores. Uh, the beers have won more than 150 war awards, including some of the uh, the best known, such as the Great American Beer Festival Award. So, high quality uh, craft beer. Uh, which accounts for about 8 to 10 percent of their sales. A deep dish, dish pizza accounts for 13 to 15 percent of the sales. Other alcohol and pizza sales are 32 to 38 percent of sales. Uh, they have a uh, pizza cookie called a pizzuki that's their uh, their uh, trademark dessert. Uh, and they do serve uh, other uh, primarily craft beers in their bar. So they uh, they do a bar and restaurant, uh, so they're not exclusively selling their own BJ's uh, brand of beers there. The um, uh, company actually leads the industry in a metric that's guests per square foot. Uh, this it means that restaurants have a higher capacity, a higher seating capacity, and they do this not by not by uh, not by just cramming more tables together, but w working with an efficient layout uh, so that they can seat more people at once. And if you can seat more people and serve them and get them out the door uh, faster than your competitors, you can actually uh, 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 you can actually improve your margins considerably, and that's one of BJ's strengths. Uh, they actually deliver average unit volume greater than nearly all other competitors, uh, even those with higher average per guest checks. Uh, BJ's is a fairly moderate uh, priced uh, restaurant chain, uh, they want to deliver what a, they call a, quote, 20 to $25 experience, unquote, for the average per, get, per check Guest per guest check cost of fourteen to fifteen dollars. Uh, so when you look at more expensive competitors such as Bonefish Grill or Cheesecake Factory, uh, they're delivering much higher uh, average per guest checks. And uh, when you look at uh, uh, competitors like TGI Fridays, Texas Roadhouse, Olive Garden, Buffalo Wild Wings, um, they're still at that fourteen to fifteen dollar per guest checks. But you're going to get a better overall experience, higher quality food, and, and uh, better ambiance from BJ's than from some of those other restaurants. So they're sort of straddling this where they're getting people to upgrade from that sports bar feel, the feel of Buffalo Wild Wings or the rustic feel of Texas Roadhouse uh, to, um, uh, to something that's closer to the little more elegance of the Cheesecake Factory or Bonefish Grill, but yet uh, at that lower price point. Uh, so the company is really smart about how they're managing their margins, and I like that quite a bit. The uh, uh, the uh, when we talk about uh, the the guests per square foot, uh, they actually have, are working with uh, architect their architect to develop prototype layouts that increase even more the guests per square foot that they can serve uh, and still maintain the quality of the experience. And they're rolling out some of those. The um, when we talk about the 174 restaurants in 23 states, uh, compare that to some of the competitors. Texas Roadhouse has 480 restaurants. Red Robin has 535. Red Lobster has 753. Outback has Outback Steakhouse has 800. Olive Garden has 844. Buffalo Wild Wings has 1,190. So almost 10 times the number of restaurants that BJ's has. Chili's has 1,596, and Applebee's has more than 2,000 
Uh, so that's why we see a lot of expansion possibility from BJ's. Uh, the company itself says that it sees a, a market of at least 425 restaurants in the United States, uh, which would be uh, almost a tripling of the restaurant numbers that they have right now. Uh, when we talk about the, some of the comparisons here uh, on the margin side, you can see on this graph uh, BJ's is in blue, Cheesecake Factory is in the yellow gold, uh, Texas Roadhouse is in red, and Buffalo Wild Wings is in green. And uh, you can see that they've, they've uh, Texas Roadhouse uh, uh, and uh, Buffalo Wild Wings, their margins have been pretty consistently declining. Cheesecake Factory a little less, uh, a little less uh, stable. Uh, and uh, they've, they've kind of clustered there. And we see the potential for BJ's as the company matures to get up to those levels. So they're trending more upward while everyone else is, is trending down or, uh, or, or flat uh, and kind of mostly down. I think Buffalo Wild Wings has, you know, the, the, gold, the good, good golden days for Buffalo Wild Wings are definitely behind them, I think, at this point. Uh, and Texas Roadhouse, uh, again, that's just a very – very strong downturn in margins uh, that they've been experiencing in the last five years. Uh, you can see, uh, I will point out over here that the uh, that the uh, 2008, you can see almost all of these chains uh, experienced a downturn. Uh, these are considered consumer cyclical businesses. Uh, Buffalo Wild Wings uh, did not. Uh, they were, uh, I think the reason for that is they were they were in this kind of explosive phase where they were the, the hot new restaurant at the time, and so they benefited uh, despite the declining economy. People said, oh, well, let's go check out that, that new Buffalo Wild Wings. Uh, so they really uh, were able to capture some mind share there uh, during that, the, that recession. But we would expect all of these companies in a future recession uh, to experience downturns uh, as well. And hopefully BJ's not as much as, as they become more uh, more widely available and people understand that value proposition that the company is working so hard to define. Uh, uh, Carol asks if they have any gluten-free beer and I uh, I don't think that they make any gluten-free beer but I'm pretty sure and certain that they serve it in their restaurant. It's pretty popular. To, uh, their lineup, they might have 75 beers on tap and uh, uh, and in bottles at any single restaurant. So they probably will have a uh, gluten-free alternatives there. Uh, Diane says, what states are uh, the, the uh, BJ's restaurants located in? Well, they are located um, in, um, uh, uh, they started in California. So uh, that's where uh, they started in 1978. The company went public in 1996. So they've expanded out from there. Their expansion plan is clustered along I-75 from Florida, Interstate 75 from Florida to Michigan, Interstate 95 from Florida to New York, and Interstate 10 from Georgia to Texas. So they are in Florida now. Uh, I visited one in Orlando earlier this year. It was my first visit. Uh, and so I think that uh, in those 23 states, you'll find them in, uh, um, in, that, ex in that expansion area uh, in the southeast and up the east coast where they are just, they just have no presence uh, right now. Um, let, me, uh, let, me, let me grab, I have a, I have a, a I have a, an investor presentation from them. Let me just grab that real quick, uh, and we can take a look at that. All right, here, here is where they are right now. Uh, so you can see uh, through uh, all of the uh, all of the. Uh, sort of the light brown states are where they have businesses right now or, or where they are expanding into. The brown ones, uh, I think, are the ones that they uh, are not planning to serve in this kind of corridor. Uh, and then the white states are the ones where they don't have a presence at all and aren't, aren't planning one in the near term. Uh, so uh, you'll find them 
Uh, Laura says you'll find them Florida, Denver, Seattle. She's been to them, and they have a great happy hour. I think there's a big high customer satisfaction uh, with BJ's uh, that they uh, that they like there. Uh, Kelvin says, what's the source of the guests per square feet uh, that are mentioned uh, there? Uh, and that information comes from um, the uh, Piper Jaffray. Uh, has a restaurant's um, benchmark. Um, here is the here is uh, the graph that uh, BJ's has put together uh, for the guests per square foot and the average unit volume. So uh, it, it's this is no, there's no nothing special about a guest per square foot. You can you determine uh, the you know the size of your average restaurant and then the average number of guests that are served there in a, in a uh, in a seating, and you can figure out this uh, metric, and above the average unit volume. Again, this is really significant. When you look at Buffalo Wild Wings over here, which has unit volume of $3,200, um, that's 20, you know, the, and, and BJ's is over here with $5,700, um, uh, 50, and these are in thousands, uh, 5.5. Seven million dollars per location compared to 3.2 million dollars for Buffalo Wild Wings. So even though BJ's has a smaller number of stores, uh, you know every time they add a store, they're adding a significant annual uh, unit volume to it. And Cheesecake Factory, again, you would expect them to have a higher unit volume because they have higher prices. As you come down here, uh, we have Chevy's Fresh Mex uh, right here. Olive Garden, Texas Roadhouse, Bonefish Grill, uh, Chili's, Red Robin, Applebee's, Ruby Tuesday, uh, and so uh, you know again, uh, and again, this is from BJ, so they're 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 displaying the uh, the information that makes them look most favorable, but it really gives you an idea of the potential here as the as BJ's opens more locations, uh, what the growth potential might be, uh, and that's uh, certainly. Uh, uh, tailwinds that we're going to help deliver uh, greater growth uh, in the future. So there's that that pretax profit comparison again, a little little uh, little interpretation there with some of those uh, chains that we just talked about, uh, and I think I think. Uh, you know, a little variation here as the company is adjusting, finding their stride, uh, but I think they're still, still small enough. On the technical side, uh, they are, uh, the trend has been down. Uh, they breached their 50 and 200 day moving averages uh, in the last, uh, the last month or so, but you can see over here that uh, the uh, current price is just about to break through uh, that 200-day uh, moving average, the gray line there, which would be a bullish indicator. Uh, so all it needs is a dollar or two up in price uh, to break through, and uh, that would be give you a little more technical strength. Uh, and then if it hit that 50-day, uh, we'd expect to see uh, a bump up uh, again on the technical side. So there's nothing here that's uh, especially alarming. Uh, it's just telling us fundamentally uh, the company looks good uh, and technically there's a little hesitation, but uh, uh, nothing that would say, oh no, things are, are really, really uh, bearish uh, on the technical side for BJ's, I don't think. So what are you buying? Uh, please let me know if you have any questions here. Um, uh, Hugh asks, what is your take on so many of, of stock PEs being very high instead of the normal 15 to 17? Is this something that we should be concerned about? Well, I, there are two things that high PE stocks could experience. One is uh, their earnings catch up, and so the price doesn't move, uh, and the PE ratio comes down, or earnings go down, uh, and the price falls, and then uh, you see that P ratio uh, return to normal, uh, normal what we would consider a normal range, and it, that's always the question. Uh, in 2007, uh, I noticed the same trend that P E ratios were much higher than they had been uh, on average. When you look at the five-year history, you were seeing companies, uh, good companies, but just seeing those those P E ratios up into that bullish range uh, at the high end. Uh, and you'll see this, I think, in section three, 
you'll see the high PE ratios and the low PE ratios for an awful lot of companies that kind of that as of 2015 were at uh, high levels than they've been in the last couple of years and those averages a little higher uh, so again it's a period of, of perhaps overvaluation of the market uh, if the market continues uh, to do what's been doing the first six months of the year, which is a 5% gain, uh, that would be a terrific year for the market to see it go up 10% at the end of the year. I expect we're going to have volatility. I expect we're going to have fluctuation. Uh, I expect that we're going to have uh, some uh, some more shocks on the global market. Uh, there could be some shocks in the U.S. market as well. We know You can never predict those things. And that's going to drive uh, the volatility uh, and that, thus valuations up and down of the overall market. Um, you know, on the small cap side, things are a little different. When we look at small company stocks, we do see expanding PE ratios for many companies simply because of where they are in their company cycle. They're getting more visibility, more uh, they're becoming more more better known by uh, investors. Uh, they're seeing their float increase, and that in turn drives the PE expansion. But on the large caps, I think you got to be careful when you're buying those large caps, and especially the mega caps, uh, because uh, they, are, they are priced not necessarily uh, for a decline, but certainly for a little bit of a pullback uh, if uh, earnings uh, trip up at all with those companies. So uh, that's my take on it. It's hard to kind of figure out. Uh, uh, I know, kind of figure out, but uh, I am not um, uh, not especially worried uh, at this point. But as always, use caution. And some companies, when you see them at that uh, those elevated levels, uh, you might want to just wait before you buy any of those companies. Um, Nancy uh, asks about eGov which is a stock we track in our uh, small cap informer uh, newsletter. The, the ticker is eGov. The, um, uh, uh, let me update, update the data there. Uh, the, um, uh, the company is NIC. This is a company that makes uh, and, and supports primarily web-based applications for city, state, local, municipal, federal, government agencies. Uh, so they contract with the government to deliver a portal for a particular state to process driver's license applications or uh, uh, real estate property tax collection uh, so that the citizens can log on and take care of tasks. Instead of going down to the DMV and uh, sitting in line, you might be able to renew your driver's license uh, online. So NIC makes those, uh, those kinds of companies uh, those kinds of applications uh, that are licensed out, and then they they have uh, various arrangements on how they get uh, how they get paid. So this is a business that requires a whole lot of working with government agencies, navigating bureaucracy, responding to resp re requests for proposals, making bids on business, uh, getting contracts that typically are not long-term contracts because the state governments and the local governments have to uh, have to reevaluate those contracts every couple of years and put them out to bid again uh, so it doesn't uh, uh, engender a whole lot of customer loyalty when your business is only for two years and and uh, then you've got to put in another bid for it. Uh, but uh, NIC does this as well as anybody uh, and they've got uh, a good business uh, history of tracking it. Um, you know, their margins have been pretty stable the last few years. Uh, this business has become more competitive uh, for sure, uh, not entirely recession proof. A lot of uh, governments, as their tax collections have gone down, have put off uh, improvements that might benefit their 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 citizens, their customer base, and that's impacted NIC. But you can see that the margins have been improving by and large the last couple of years. This is definitely a business with a high PE ratio. The current PE ratio is 33. Uh, and it's uh, that's pretty low uh, on just 15 to 20 percent earnings growth. Uh, so it's been a, it's been quite a, a business uh, to watch out for. Uh, so on this down and dirty SSG right here, this is not an official SSG. It's about a uh, point point uh, five 
uh, to one upside downside, which would put it in the hold range. Uh, so uh, we track it. Uh, right now we're holding it in the small cap informer, um, and so we don't have any um, we don't have any any uh, uh, feeling right now uh, that uh, it's a company to get rid of. But I haven't seen the uh, the second quarter results yet, so uh, that could always change. Carol says, any good ideas in the security area, given the huge growth anticipated for the Internet of Things? Well, certainly uh, uh, someone else asked about Skyworks. Uh, Jay asked about Skyworks. Uh, and uh, they're, they're definitely kind of playing into that Internet of Things. Um, the security area, uh, we tracked AVG for a while, uh, and uh, eventually uh, we uh, didn't see the potential, thought that the company... Uh, had, had not been performing as well, so we, we removed it from the small cap informer. And last month, they were uh, picked up by Avast, uh, and uh, uh, I think because they were able to get a good deal because ABG's uh, uh, price had had just not been recovering, and fundamentally, they had kind of tapped out their growth. So Avast was able to acquire them. Uh, so it's a good outlook for AG, AVG investors, I would say. Uh, at this point, uh, and that's uh, on the security side for personal computers. Uh, but uh, there's there are a lot of headwinds in that in that particular business. Individuals are not used to paying for uh, antivirus and network security, uh, computer security products. So uh, n despite all of the the bad press and uh, all of the things that are going on, where uh, people's passwords are being stolen. Uh, Individuals don't seem to be adopting any smarter behavior. Uh, on certainly on the on the um, uh, on the, the 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 global business side of things, companies like uh, Oracle and Microsoft are certainly working on solutions that will help companies to protect their data. Um, in terms of uh, you know, there there are. I think it's we we don't know yet at this point. There's a whole whole uh, arena of internet enabled devices mobile starting with mobile phones but going down to refrigerators and uh, 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 Wi-Fi routers that are used in the home and washing machines even and uh, 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 internet driven light switches and thermostats uh, that are unproven and have in many cases been been shown, demonstrated to be unsafe or that allow access. Uh, so, so if you're not familiar with some of these devices, uh, you can get a, a special light bulb that connects to your Wi-Fi wi router that allows you with your smartphone to turn on and off lights uh, in your house. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of interesting from a security perspective. You can make the lights look like somebody's at home when you're away. You can schedule them on a timer that's connected to your phone and your router and your software and your computer. Uh, but um, uh, you can extend that, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the person who must have coffee first thing in the morning, morning can program the coffee maker to start up and make, have a cup by the time you get down, ready by the time you get downstairs to the kitchen uh, in the morning. Uh, but go on from there, uh, there's some other imp interesting implications in terms of uh, internet, uh, having a security camera in your home or alarm systems. So, so there, there are large implications besides the, the uh, kind of novelty thing of being able to turn on and off lights from your phone. But the, uh, the downside is that some of these systems have not been built with the most secure uh, network connections in them, which means that uh, in theory someone could, could uh, uh, crack into your Wi-Fi enabled light bulb get into your router, which is connected to your computer, uh, and thus bypass the firewall that you would set up that pre prevents people from coming into your internet connection uh, from outside your, your home Wi-Fi router. So uh, at, I, at this point, I don't have any, uh, any clear uh, 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 play on what, might, what companies might be involved in that space or working to make that, uh, to make that safer. Uh, security is definitely something where there are plenty of opportunities, but I, I'm not sure how 
as investors, we're going to be able to find stocks that kind of feed into uh, that um, uh, very directly at this point. Uh, so just a couple of uh, ideas here. I see some other ideas here. Um, my, what's my outlook on Skyworks, uh, Jay says. Um, at, at this point, I think the company is, you know, obviously Apple's uh, declining uh, earnings and sales, product sales uh, has an impact. But I think they're... Uh, uh, I think they are nimble enough that they will be able to recover, uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about their longer-term prospects. They may have a tough couple of quarters ahead of them, uh, but Skyworks Solutions, I think that they're, um, uh, I think that they uh, have a, a pretty good, uh, a pretty good business uh, of developing hardware, developing those chips uh, that are used in a, in a lot more, an increasing number of devices. Uh, so, so I'm pretty, pretty, pretty optimistic, and I, I would not be surprised uh, to see them get acquired uh, by one of the mega players in, in the business, uh, but uh, yeah, certainly not banking on that at this point. Uh, Carol says, uh, still looking at uh, healthcare, playing on that baby boomer need, ACHC and uh, SRCL. Uh, certainly, ACHC is uh, Acadia Healthcare, uh, and this is a stock we've looked at before. Uh, it is uh, involved in. Oh, let me. Uh, I'm going to download another copy. So here's ACHC. Uh, they, they operate to network, a network of uh, 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 clinics, uh, and mental health uh, and addiction uh, clinics. Uh, they're expanding globally. Uh, you can see the growth has been very strong here. Sales up 68% in, for the first quarter on with earnings up 34%. Uh, so they have been uh, doing quite well. We've got to add another scale here. Their, their growth has been pretty strong. Um, more eliminate 2011, that down year there, uh, just to give you a sense of some of the trends there. Uh, analysts looking at, uh, oh, there's no analyst estimate. Um, um, and I don't know, I don't re recall offhand what our, our estimate is in uh, the uh, small cap informer where we track it. I'll just plot it, plot in 15%, which I think is pretty conservative uh, for the business. Uh, they've been growing, growing organically and growing by acquisition, making a lot of acquisitions. And you can see they've been taking on debt, quite a bit of debt in order to make that happen. Let's eliminate that year and look at that graph again. Um, so their debt to equity, long-term debt to equity is pretty high, but they've got a good track record of buying, buying those, making those acquisitions and then uh, uh, paying down the debt and, and seeing good results coming from it. Um, so right now, a little, little elevated in price uh, on a kind of conservative down and dirty SSG. Uh, but again, I'm optimistic about the longer term picture uh, and they perform quite well in our small cap uh, performer newsletter for sure. Uh, and then you asked about Stericycle, a uh, little bigger business. Um, uh, and uh, perhaps a little, well, you know, they had a down year last year, and I think that's kind of hurt hurt their, uh, the comparisons. Uh, and so I don't follow the company, so I don't really have a strong opinion about it. Uh, this has all the earmarks of a, uh, a one-time event, though, that we might take a look at. Uh, so... Um, and Kathleen says, what about hack? Oh, not found. So, yep, not familiar with that company. Uh, SLP Simulations Plus. This one, the name is familiar. I'm not sure that I know the business. There we go. Um, very tiny business there. 
Oh, but look at that. That's a pretty good, not a bad trend. Uh, so sales of 18 million last year. Um, so yeah, we expect to see a little more uh, inconsistency of the sales and earnings growth. And we've certainly seen those uh, as well. Good, fairly good margins. Uh, again, we can't really judge too much. The size of the company is so small. Uh, so a little bit of a downturn. But still, margins better than 30%. Uh, for a software business, the P ratio is pretty high. I would imagine that liquidity is uh, uh, a big a big issue here, and uh, slightly elevated stock price. But something I you know I would on the basis of this stock study, I'd be interested if the price was a little bit cheaper or if I could justify uh, the valuation. Uh, maybe that valuation is a little uh, uh, is a little. Uh, a little co too conservative for the company, uh, but it's definitely a company I, I want to know more about. Problem with it is the small size uh, at an $18 million company. Uh, it's not going to have a whole lot, 78% owned by insiders. It's not going to have a whole market available. So even when, when things are good, uh, it's not a company that you can buy a lot of shares of uh, and uh, uh, that uh, we would expect to see a lot of price increase from in short order. All right, uh, I, sorry, we're going to have to wrap up. I, I did want to mention uh, that I'll be at the Money Show in San Francisco uh, next month in August. I'll be at the heart of Oklahoma for their EduFest at the end of August. And then the Money Show is coming to Dallas on October 20th and 21st for the first time. Uh, and so I will be there as well. Uh, we've been doing some summer Stock Central uh, webinars, some special webinars for Stock Central and Equity Research subscribers only. Uh, later this month on July 28th, I'll be giving a presentation on dumb mistakes investors make and how to avoid them. And then Russell Malley will be in August with Are You Cooking Your Stock Selection Guides? Uh, Russell did a webinar last month uh, in June uh, entitled uh, Is Your Brain Sabotaging Your Investments? So we're kind of looking at a theme here of how we can eliminate emotion and uh, and counterbalance the irrational thoughts that our brains often uh, deliver to us uh, that impact our investment decision making. Uh, for these special webinars, you can find the links at stockcentral.com or equityresearchservice.com in the uh, in the uh, uh, message boards. There, you'll find the links, and those you must be an active subscriber to either of those websites in order to make that work. This week on Thursday, uh, and that is uh, July 14th, not July, uh, not July uh, 11th, I believe. Right? Today is the today is the 11th, so July 14th, Thursday uh, at, the, at retailinvestorconferences.com. Uh, I'll be giving a talk on what does Brexit mean for long-term stock investors. So we'll talk about that British decision to exit the European Union uh, and uh, the impact on, on it so far and what it could mean for us as long-term stock investors. Uh, the specific time has not been announced yet. Uh, if you've attended the uh, retail investor conferences in the past, these are the ones sponsored by PR Newswire and Better Investing, uh, then you'll get an email uh, that will give you the uh, the details. Otherwise, you can find out more on retailinvestorconferences.com. So thanks for joining us today. I hope this was uh, informative for you. I look forward to seeing you next month, uh, and I hope that you're enjoying your summer. Stay cool and uh, remain invested in the stock market. And until next time, I'm Doug Gerlach. Thanks again. <music>